the therapeutic power of the relationship, uh, specifically the relationship between the counselor and the counselee. When I was uh, a beginner in the area of uh, psychotherapy, one of the most frequent questions we asked was, what are the best techniques in, in counseling? How can I learn the practice of therapeutic techniques? And uh, I always got the same reply from my mentors. I remember uh, Dr. Monty Barker from Bristol. The technique is not important. The best technique is yourself. And I never forgot that reply. And later on, over the years, I came to experience that was really true. And it's a key concept in counseling and also in professional psychotherapy. This is why a couple or three years ago, I devoted this uh, a whole lecture to this topic. And apparently it was very appreciated because you asked me to repeat it. We are the best technique in counseling. The most therapeutic tool is not a good technique, but a good relationship. I would say that this is the summary of all that I'm going to say this afternoon. And this can be applied both to counseling and to psychotherapy. And actually, I would say that it could be applied in any healing process, including conventional medical practice. The most important, the best therapeutic tool is not a good technique, but a good relationship. The, the relationship, the counselee, counselor's relationship contains in itself the most powerful forces in what we call the therapeutic link and the therapeutic process. As we will see in a minute, change, profound change, always occurs in the context of a good interpersonal relationship. Yesterday, we started considering Jesus as our model. And today, this idea will be reserved to the end. We will be considering the model of Jesus in a special encounter relationship he had with the Samaritan woman, but that will be at the end. The techniques we use are secondary importance compared to our personality and our capacity to be empathic for empathy and to establish a warm relationship. As I said, here lies the core of all counseling and ultimately all therapeutic act. Now, this was <clears throat> sort of a of summary of what I'm going to say this afternoon. Now, let's remember that both in psychotherapy and counseling, the word is very important. Counseling and psychotherapy art are the, are the art of healing with the word. They are the art of healing with the word. The word is of capital importance. And the word is transmitted by a person, a living person. And our words can be killing or can be uplifting and encouraging. We should not forget that Jesus Christ is named the word, the verb. He is the word par excellence. So today, in this relationship, we will see how words are so 
important. A wise use of the word, genuine communication, makes us deeply human and brings forth a profound healing effect. So relationship as a whole and the word, particularly within this context, is most therapeutic. Now, after this short introduction, let's start with the first point this afternoon. The best therapeutic tool is not a good technique, but a good relationship. Change, as we said, in psychotherapy or counseling always occurs in the context of a good interpersonal relationship. And all experts in psychotherapy and counseling agree in this. The personality of the therapist comes first. And any psychotherapeutic technique, or at least most of the counseling or psychotherapeutic techniques work much better in the context of a good relationship. When two people really listen to each other, they meet. There is a magic click, an encounter, and this encounter changes us, remodels us, even to the point of reshaping our brain synapses. It's fascinating to know, and this is a very recent discovery in neurosciences, that there is some sort of reshaping in our neuronal structure as a result of counseling or psychotherapy. This modern neuroimage has proved that this is true. Counseling, psychotherapy can change our mind. Now, let's consider some key ingredients for a good therapeutic relationship. And this is my second point this afternoon. Key ingredients for a good therapeutic relationship. I would like to mention four, four basic ingredients. First of all, warmth, warmth. Warmth is the starting point and the permanent necessary background in the counselor's relationship with the counselee. Warmth is what makes us feel welcomed, receive. Received is the same as accepted, according to Romans 15, 7. Let's remember that verse, which is really meaningful. Paul says in Romans 15, 7, welcome one another, therefore, as Christ has welcomed you. I like that verse very much. Now, the original word welcome, welcome one another, is accept one another. Accept one another as Christ has accepted you. Now, this attitude of welcoming, you are welcome. This acceptance, you are accepted regardless of what you are going to share with me. I don't care about any, any feeling you may share. You can feel safe. I receive you warmly. That is a very important starting point. A cold, distant counselor usually does not make a good relationship, a good link. Probably this has been one of the most uh, critical points with professional psychoanalysis, where the analyst remains in a distant position and the patient lies on the coach, just sharing some thoughts and some insights. That has been very much criticized within psychoanalysis to the point that today most 
of the modern approaches to deep psychotherapy, psychoanalysis, are done in a different way. Because some form of warmth, that welcoming attitude is very important. And certainly, this is true for the Christian counselor. We need to be warm to welcome others. Now, secondly, empathy and sympathy. Empathy and sympathy are like the catalyzers that help us to open up. We feel much easy, much easier to open up our heart when we realize that the person before us is empathic and sympathetic. Empathy is the attitude that conveys this idea. I am with you. I am for you. I am with you and I am for you. We could say that empathy is like a trip, a journey to the inner world of the counselee. I like that way of putting it. Empathy is like a journey to the inner world of the counselee. Warmth opened the door and empathy means going through the door, going inside to the heart, to the soul. So now we are inside the counselor's heart or soul. The third requisite is love, agape love. What is agape love? I like a definition given by a professional psychotherapist, uh, Armand Nicoli, a Christian psychiatrist. He was professor of psychiatry at the University of Harvard, uh, a Christian. And uh, Armand Nicoli defined agape love as willing the best for the patient, in this case, the counselee, willing the best for the patient. I want the best for you and I will pursue it. I will try to get the best for you. Now, this agape love is an essential ingredient in all counseling or psychotherapeutic relationships. The important point about agape love is that we can have it regardless how you feel towards the person, towards the counselee. Agape love, it's the only kind of love that does not require positive emotions. The other dimensions of love, friendship, um, passion, and the other dimensions require a positive attitude. Agape does not require positive emotions. I just want the best for you. And this is why Jesus could say, love your enemies, love those who persecuted you. There is a dimension of agape love, which is mentioned again in this beautiful chapter of Romans 15. Sometimes we tend to believe that Romans is the letter of deep theology. And by the end of Romans, especially in the two last chapters of Romans, three last chapters, I, I recommend you as counselors that you read carefully Romans 14, 15, and 16. We find a lot of good counseling insights, pastoral care insights, beautiful. It's very rich in pastoral insights. And we find a dimension of love in Romans 15, verse 14, that I like it very much. Says Paul, I myself am satisfied about you, my brethren, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and notice now, and they able to instruct one another. What is the sine qua non condition to instruct one another? Full of goodness and filled with all knowledge. 
yesterday Phil Swan asked the question that I didn't have time to answer. What, what is our part in, in, in counseling? Here you have one of the parts. Knowledge, because there is teaching, a lot of teaching, as we will see later on. Knowledge and goodness. Goodness. And goodness is certainly a dimension of love. How important it is, all these dimensions of agape love, goodness, warmth, empathy. All these were features that we find in the counselor par excellence that was our Lord Jesus, as we will see later on. And finally, key ingredients in a good therapeutic relationship. We have seen warmth, empathy, agape love, and goodness. Finally, trust. Trust. Trust is usually the result of the previous features, a natural outcome that cements is the foundation of the relationship, gives a solid foundation. Trust makes a solid therapeutic link. In professional psychotherapy, we talk about uh, alliance, a, a professional, a therapeutic alliance between the counselor and the counselee. Now, this sort of link or alliance is based on trust. And don't forget that trust is most easily betrayed by gossiping, not being able to keep secrets. Confidentiality. Confidentiality is extremely important. We are to be very, very careful in this area, not to betray the trust that the counselee puts in us. Trust is the foundation of a good counselor's relationship. So we've seen so far the features of the, of the relationship. Now, let's go to a third point, listening. Listening, and I call this point, the core of the therapeutic relationship, the core. I usually tell uh, my, my pupils, my students that learning to say nothing is more difficult than learning to say something. Learning to say nothing is more difficult than learning to say something. A counselor that is beginning usually feels that you should reply, you should give advice, you should say, forget about that. It's much more important to remain silent rather than saying something. Actually, in counseling and psychotherapy, we could say that words are silver, but silence is golden. Words are silver, but silence is golden. Learn to be silent and to listen carefully and empathically. Listening carefully is deeply healing in itself. Nothing is more therapeutic than active, unhurried listening. A passionate, warm listening conveys a powerful message. It is a sort of dialogue where two persons are speaking. One speaks with his or her mouth. The other one speaks with his or her eyes. I will never forget an experience I had uh, in my first year when I started as a psychiatrist. I had a patient, it was a female patient, a woman, and uh, she started, it was the first appointment, 
and she started sharing and talking. She was talking without interruption for about 45, 50 minutes, which is the average length of a first session. And uh, then I interrupted and I said, uh, we should be coming to a close because uh, it's almost time. And uh, after 45 minutes talking without interruption, she said, oh, thank you, doctor. It has been a very enriching conversation. <laughs> I had not opened my mouth. I hadn't said a single word. And she said, it was a very enriching conversation. Listening is a form, is a way of speaking. As we said, you are speaking with your eyes. This is key in the relationship as a therapeutic tool. Remember what we said about empathy, entering a journey to the other person's soul? When you listen, you are entering the other person, discovering what is in their mind and in their heart. It was Shakespeare who said, listening with your eyes is a delicate expression of love. Shakespeare was not a professional counselor or psychotherapist, but he was indeed a very good, uh, he knew very well human nature. Listening with your eyes is a delicate expression of love. When we are listened, we feel understood and loved. When we are listened, we feel understood and loved. Now, many people believe that feeling understood means that you agree with them and they blame you. You don't understand me when you don't agree with them. That is not a requisite for a good relationship. You should not look for agreement with the counselor. There is something above agreement which is more important and it is this attitude of listening. We could say more things about listening, but I think uh, it's uh, so far. Uh, we, perhaps in, in the question time, we can go uh, more into detail. Now let's consider, lastly, Jesus, our model. In the life of Jesus, we see several encounters that transformed, were tr life transforming, transformed the lives of those he encountered, he met. We remember Matthew, we remember Nicodemus, we remember Zacchaeus. All of them were transformed by Jesus. I would like to mention the specific case of the Samaritan woman. It's a, a fascinating process of an in-depth and holistic healing. You remember what we said yesterday about holistic growth, holistic discipleship. So the encounter with the Samaritan woman is a good example on this. Jesus' attitude towards the Samaritan woman reveals a deep love for her as a person, the whole person, sensitivity and empathy. And the dialogue is fascinating because in it we see all the levels of human communication. Let's stop here for a moment. The different levels of human communication. I think there are basically three levels where we communicate from the most superficial to the deepest one. This applies to all sorts of relationships. And of course, it is uh, certainly important in, uh, in counseling. The first level 
is the level of words. We simply share words, exchange words. And the goal of this first level is politeness, courtesy. Give me some water, for example. Uh, where are you from, etc. Simple exchange of words. There is a deeper level where there is an exchange of ideas, an exchange of ideas. Jesus and the Samaritan woman start talking on religion and rights. Where should we worship? Where is the right place to worship? Still, this was not satisfactory to the to the Jesus that wanted to the reach the heart of that woman. The exchange of ideas does not reach the heart, only the mind. And if you want to correct someone, if you really want to influence someone, deep change cannot occur only in the mind. It needs to occur, as we saw yesterday, in the heart, a new heart. Changing the mind may be a good beginning, but it needs to reach the heart. This is why Jesus goes deeper to the third level, and the dialogue culminates in sharing feelings, emotions, and all that was in her most intimate life, the inner life. You've had five husbands, and the one you have is not your husband. So an exchange of the inner heart. There was a disclosure of the woman's soul where Jesus could reach and intervene. And that is a good illustration of what happens in counseling. Usually this is done in a progressive way, but it's most important that we do not force the counselee to open up their heart all of a sudden, but follow this delicate strategy of Jesus from level one, simple words, courtesy, to level two, ideas, talking about religion, to level three, opening, opening up your heart, self-disclosure. So Jesus proves himself to be a master in the art of conversation, communication, dialogue, leading the woman to the level of insight she needs to see and understand her problem. Now, um, we are going very well with uh, the clock, with time. I would like to um, finish by sharing a little bit about the, the content. So far, we have seen the, the, the form of the relationship. Now, the contents, what should this relationship include? What is the, the, the teaching that should be given in this counseling relationship? Let's remember that Christian counseling is not the same as psychotherapy. And as we said yesterday, the growth, the growth is always directed towards this uh, growing into Christ likeness. Now, let me uh, close by mentioning the, the model here. And yesterday, we particularly put the emphasis on the model of Jesus. And now I would like to mention today the model of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has basically two functions. Comforting, the parakaleo, and guiding to all truth. Comforting and guiding to all truth truth. And uh, I would like to read um, some uh, verses, some references in the Bible that help us 
see this twofold dimension, the encouraging, the comforting, and the guiding to all truth. Let's say, for example, in Luke 42, 32, in Luke 42, 32, Let's read also 31. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith, your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Strengthen your brothers. The, the Greek word is sterizo, the idea of confirm, affirm, consolidate someone or something in such a way that it is solid, well-rooted, with good foundation. This is the first action that the Holy Spirit makes in this counseling process, confirmation, strengthening. And this is part of the parakaleo, of the comforting. Comforting is not only making you feel better. Of course, it includes feeling, making you feel better. But let's remember what we said yesterday. The ultimate goal in pastoral care in pastoral counseling in discipleship is not feeling better a mere relief of tensions the purpose is to help the person grow i think we need to remember this in a time when there is strong influence from the eastern religions and especially buddhism where the purpose is simply avoid suffering. The nirvana is simply avoid suffering. Certainly, strengthening in the face of suffering is important, but affirming, confirming, strengthening is the really key word here. So this is one of the dimensions of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has these two wings. Comforting, that means confirming and strengthening, and then guiding to all truth, guiding to all truth, correcting, instructing, teaching. If we read Matthew 28, when Jesus um, establishes the Great Commission, he says, make disciples and go teaching them. Let's, let's read that verse which is, I think is very important in terms of discipleship. Uh, Matthew 28. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Teaching them everything I have commanded you. That element of teaching is very, very important. And that includes correction. As we saw yesterday in Colossians 1, 28, admonishing and instructing and teaching every man in Christ. Well, I think um, we could close here by remembering that um, counseling is not something only reserved to trained people, some specialists in the church. Of course, there are some people in the church who have the gift of exhortation, the gift of counseling, and specific counseling is reserved for these people. Those of you here are part of this, but in a broad sense, counseling, in this sense that the Holy Spirit performs, strengthening one another, sharing one another burdens, correcting, instructing one another, 
is a duty of every member in the body. The mutual pastoral care should not be neglected. I think it's very important to remember that the church as a whole is a healing community. So not all the burden should be on the professional counselors or in those who have the gift of counseling, but everybody in the church should play a role in this area of sharing one another's burdens.